Okay, welcome everybody. We're this is David Wildstein, the editor of the New Jersey Globe, and I'm here with Micah Rasmussen, the director of the Rebovich Institute of New Jersey Politics at Ryder University, and Joey Fox, a reporter for the New Jersey Globe. And we're going to talk a little bit about tomorrow's primary, mostly uh, races for for Congress uh, throughout the state. I mean, there's there's a lot of primaries. There's a lot of districts that have races, but I think when you come right down to it, uh, not a huge number of competitive races, not not a lot that everybody's going to be hinging on. Does that, Mike, does that, do you agree with that? I do. Um, the caveat to all of that is that since these are low turnout affairs, um, there can be surprises. There are surprises that we're not expecting, but there, there, there can be surprises. If there's ever going to be a surprise, it's going to be on a day like tomorrow a low turnout election and and by every we we see this and we see it every 12 years uh when you have congress heading the ticket no president no united states senate uh the last two times it's happened so 2010 1998 mm -hmm. turnout was in the single digits statewide i mean is there mike is there any you you've been watching vote by mail and early voting numbers very closely any any indication that New Jersey is going to break out of that mold? No. Um, I just, before the program started, I um, tried to look at the four main districts that we're following um, and see how we're doing on turnout. It ranges. In the fifth district, they're at 14% of the, of the uh, 2010 turnout. Um, it goes up to 23% of the 2010 turnout in District 3. And they're at 29% of the turnout in LD7, and they're at 31% of the turnout in LD4, or CD4, I should say. Um, now, we should say that the districts are different than they were then, so you can compare apples to apples, but it, it really ranges. We're looking for maybe 30,000 votes per district in those districts, and we're at under 10,000 so far in each of those districts. Joey, what are you what are you seeing just in terms of turnout? What's your what's your take? I mean, I've not been tracking turnout as closely as Micah, certainly. But I mean, it, in general, it makes sense that this is if, if any year is going to have a low turnout primary this year, not just because of the sort of blue moon cycle of no president, no Senate, um, but also because, you know, you don't have any multi hundreds of thousands of dollars type congressional races. Like there are some times where you've got three different county lines that are duking it out for one safe democratic district or something. And, and that will produce a certain effect, at least within that district. You don't really see that this time. You've got a couple of Republican primaries that may or may not be competitive. None of them have had crazy high spending. Um, even in those primaries, it's really going to come down to voters who are very tuned in, very engaged. Um, and they're just not going to be that many of them, I don't think. So let's let's start. We always, whenever we do this, we start in the south and we go north. Uh, but let's start in the north and let's start in the fifth district, which uh, uh, is is mostly Bergen County, a little over seventy percent Bergen, uh, some in Passaic and and some Sussex. And this is this is one race. I'm 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 as confident as I can be in in thinking I know where everything's going, but recently I'm just, I'm not sure about the fifth. This is Frank Pilata, who is the 2022 nominee, uh, running off the line in Bergen, but with the support of the Passaic and Sussex Republicans. And Nick DiGregorio, uh, first time candidate, Marine Corps combat veteran, served in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're both trying to run against the human fundraising machine, Josh Godheimer. Uh, they're both uh, really spending down on whatever money they have, waiting for Godheimer's 15 million or whatever it's up to after the primary. Uh, but I'm not I'm not sure where this race is going. Uh, let me start with Joey. What do you what do you think? I mean, yeah. So in some ways, 
so this is in some ways a repeat of 2020 when Pallada ended up being the nominee. The person who he beat in the Republican primary that year was uh, John McCann, who had previously been the nominee in 2018. So keep on having these repeat nominees or repeat candidates, I should say. Um, McCann had the Bergen line, whereas Pallada had the line in, or the support at least, of the Republican parties and the other outlying counties. Uh, but importantly, McCann sort of, he didn't have super strong support even within Bergen County. He was kind of a controversial nominee. He bled support to, from legislators like now late state Senator Jerry Cardinale endorsed Pallada. You had this kind of feeling that even though Bergen County Republicans were officially behind him, wasn't necessarily a super strong endorsement. And so what Pallada did was he just barely lost Bergen. He lost up, I don't know, six points or something like that. I forgot exactly what it was. Uh, and completely cleaned up the rest of the district. And it was about split half and half. And that was plenty enough to win. He won by a lot. This time, you've kind of got it where, A, Bergen County is more of the district. It's about 62% of the Republican primary vote instead of 52%. So that's a mathematical difficulty for Pilata right off the bat. Um, and, you know, you don't see the sort of second guessing about De Gregorio the way that you maybe saw about McCann. He is just a stronger candidate in a lot of ways. Uh, and you won't necessarily see the kind of, at least at the establishment level, breaking away from the line. At the individual voter level, that's the big question, right? Pallada may be a name brand in a lot of Republican households in this district. He just ran in 2020. He was their guy against Gottheimer. So what it really comes down to, at least in my opinion, is whether these Republicans, especially in Bergen County, are interested in a, a new face, the one who has the support of the party establishment in Bergen this time around, or whether they're going to go and they're going to support the guy who they already know had their back in 2020 and is going again in 2022. So, so David, as, as you and I have talked about in the last couple of days, it is true that Pallada does not have the line in Bergen, but he does have the, 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 the first line. He has, he has yeah. position A, the poll position. I'm going to share that screen so that everybody yeah. can see what this what this line look, what the ballot looks like in Bergen County. Yeah. So see, that's not a bad position to be in for somebody who didn't get the line. Right. And you're, so what you're seeing is there's no marquee name on this ballot to head the line. You don't, you don't have Donald Trump. You don't have a, a, a U.S. Senate candidate or, or, you know, if it was a legislative candidate, a, a governor to sort of attract people to it, What you've got are, a lot of names that people don't know. Todd Caliguire running for county executive on the line, but he hasn't he hasn't won public office in 25 years. Right. Uh, Linda Barba outspending Caliguire by a little bit. Uh, uh, Paul Dugan running for county commissioner, and this one I you know it just it just sticks with me. Four years ago, he ran off the line with Steve Lonigan and came within 123 votes of winning the Republican nomination for county executive against the line. So I think the, I think the takeaway here is the way this ballot is designed. Uh, you know, you have, you have the line being full in the sense that it goes down to local candidates and county committee candidates, but the top of it, it doesn't look like he's off. I don't see any, I don't see any you know, uh, uh, ballot Siberia here. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. No, this is not a bit. This is this is about what you want if you're not going to if you're not going to run the line. Maybe it's even better than the line, arguably, in this case. Well, because it's it's the it's the first column. Exactly. You're the you're the top spot on the ballot. You're the first spot on the ballot. And, uh, you know, I, I have to you know, this might be a theme as we go through some of these districts, which are, you know, I've, I've been doing this a long time. You know, Mike has been doing it a long time. Joey will do this for a long time after after I'm I'm gone. But but you always see names on a ballot that you if you if you blink you're going to miss them and you will never see these names again. Fred Schneiderman ran a lot of bluster. Uh, signed up Kellyanne Conway as his consultant. Uh, signed up probably the best media guy on the Republican side, Larry Weitzner. Uh, but didn't put, didn't dig into his own pocket, uh, and then dropped out after it was too late to take his name off the ballot. And Sab Skandari, I mean, I, I still don't really know who he is uh, and and what he's doing in the race. But I mean, Mike, if you had a guess, I mean, you say everybody who's on the ballot is going to get a, a couple points. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about the, the lack of a household name and whether or not there's residual value from 2020. Um, you know, generally speaking, you and I tend to be dismissive of that because we've seen how much higher profile politicians don't even register, don't even don't even measure on the, a blip on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, but for Republicans, and, and by the way, they've had some help here with with some friends of Josh Gottheimer. They right. may I want to remember, talk about that, too. Go, go ahead. Yeah, they may remember yeah. that Pilata ran two years ago, and they may remember that Pilata had Trump's endorsement, which, you know, is something we're going to talk about here. But but that may be the one thing they remember going into this ballot. And and besides the fact that I, I it, it would be terrible for four Sabs and to lose to a guy who's who's dropped out of the race. But but that is that is the uh, the the you know, I don't know if we should call it the elephant in the room or not, which is Josh Gottheimer trying to pick his opponent. Mm -hmm. uh, Gottheimer, by all appearances, uh, would rather run against Frank Pallotta uh, than run against Nick DiGregorio, a, a young candidate, maybe bringing something else in. We've seen uh, veteran candidates across the country having incredible success. Uh, so Gottheimer's done a few mailings to Republicans uh, criticizing Pallotta for his ties to Trump and for for being too Republican. Joey, how does that, how do you think that's gonna play? I mean, I think the most important thing that it does is Pallotta is broke. He has been raising really paltry amounts of money and he has not been self-funding the way that he did to some extent in the 2020 primary and then to greater extent in the 2020 general election that just that money has not appeared yet. So he's got very little money to work with. So in this kind of, and, and De Gregorio is quite a bit. So in this context, Gottheimer, throwing down his own money, or maybe it's not Gottheimer's money, it's a clear, some kind of democratic related organization throwing down this money. Um, that, could, that could be a big difference because it, it might make the difference between someone, a voter getting three De Gregorio mailers and nothing else to respond to it versus three De Gregorio mailers and one Pallotta is too conservative mailer. And they'll be like, oh, well, I like it when people are conservative. I remember this guy's name from 2020, sure. Yeah. But like, who knows that that is an entirely rational set of steps for a voter to go through. And that flips a vote from De Gregorio right. and Pallotta. So I think that it could end up being very impactful in the margins. Yeah. I'm not I don't I don't know if there's going to be a winner tomorrow night or not, but but I'm not I'm not sure that I uh, I, I, I think I agree with Gottheimer that uh, the De Gregorio is is potentially a stronger general election candidate. And National uh, Republicans seem to think that too. De Gregorio yeah. is on their on the radar, which uh -huh. is sort of a lower version of their preferred candidates. But it's like people were interested in, um, and he's the only one from the district who's on that list. So, so they definitely like him. I imagine they would throw lip service to Pallotta if he won, but that might be a lower priority race if he did win the primary. And you have to remember, as much as as much as as I'm cynical of you know, be careful what you wish for, um, um, Congressman. Um, we've seen what Pallotta can do, right? I mean, we've seen mm -hmm. when he's throwing everything at it that he can, when he's throwing money at it. Um, we've seen him pulling out all the stops and that didn't really get him where he needed to be. So, um, you know, I guess there is some reason to believe that. Now, the other thing that I'll say of the four districts that are on my radar, our radar, this is the one by far that has the lowest, the smallest, um, uh, advanced participation um, from early in-person voting or from absentee um, by mail, you know, voting by mail. Uh, there are only about 4,200 votes so far. That is like half of what we're seeing in District 4, for example. So it's not really on anybody's radar screen so far in the district. It's extremely low participation, even by tomorrow standards, by other district standards. All right, let's, let's go to District 8. Let's go to Hudson the Hudson County District with a little bit of Essex, a little bit of Union, Bob Menendez, Rob Menendez, the son of United States Senator Bob Menendez is running uh, for Albio Sirius's open house seat. Uh, Albio Sirius retiring uh, after 16 years in the house, coming home to run for the job he loved best in his life, which is mayor of West New York. Uh, Highly unusual for a member of Congress with that kind of seniority. He's he's walking away 
from the chairmanship of the it's the House Western Hemisphere Subcommittee of Foreign Relations to be mayor of West New York. <laughs> and and I don't think there's anybody following politics who doesn't completely get that. Nobody's thinking that's strange because in Hudson County with Albio Sirius and his love of all politics is local. I don't see that as strange anymore uh, at all. Uh, so, so the candidate from the very beginning, from the very day that Albio Sirius announced that he wasn't running is Rob Menendez. He's a Port Authority commissioner. He's an attorney from Jersey City. Uh, he's got I mean, Joey, you've, you've, you've looked at this race closely. Uh, neither of these candidates have taken off. Is there, is there any chance that Rob Menendez isn't going to win this primer? There's not really a chance that he's not going to win. I think the, there's just the factors have combined so that, you know, he has the support of everybody under the sun, except Marianne Williamson. Um, mm -hmm. He has hundreds upon hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars. Like it's, it's kind of crazy how much he's raised. I imagine a lot of that comes from, from his dad's political contacts. Um, even still incredibly impressive, just how much money he's raised. Uh, and, you know, frankly, his two opponents have not, e even though there may be valid reasons for voters not to elect him, they have not articulated those reasons, right? They don't have the money to do it. They, they haven't gotten the, the supporters and the surrogates to do it for them. So yeah, I should name them. You've got David Ocampo Grajales, who more cleanly fits in the classic, like young left wing sort of primary challenger mold um and he's raised a couple tens of thousands of dollars i forget precisely how many and then you've got annie rosebear roseboro eberhard who is this sort of semi insiderish state figure who's very involved in education she's a weehawken teacher and a member of the amistad commission which is about teaching race in in new jersey schools i mean they just they, they have not articulated um why they would be better representatives in, an, in a way that's likely to reach these voters. And I think that the real question is what the margin is. If you see something where Menendez gets a bare 50% of the vote with the two, his two challengers splitting like 25-25, that's a pretty terrible result for Menendez, frankly. And you have to look at that as, hmm, I wonder had there been an actually strong off the line challenger, whether this would have gone somewhere. And I wonder just how strong the Hudson line and the Menendez name is anymore. And I think what's more likely to happen is you're going to see Menendez reaching 70%, 75%, 80%. Uh, and what you then want to look for is, okay, where are his strengths, which is probably going to be in the heaviest Latino areas of the district. And where, if anywhere, do Roseboro Eberhard and Ocampo Grajales break through at all? I think that that's really going to be the question tomorrow night, not what is the actual victor. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Ben, I think the number that Rob Menendez is is looking at, I'm, I'm pulling it up now. I think the number he's looking at is 68.1%. And the reason is that when his dad ran for the first time uh, in, a, in a primary for the House uh, 30 <laughs> years ago, he won exactly 68%. Uh, and I think there's some competition in the <laughs> Menendez family, and I think he'd like to just beat his father's number. But Micah, any, any chance... Any chance for an upset here? No. Um, the, the candidates who may have had a shot opted to stay out because of the prohibitive advantage that the name has and the organizational strength that, that he has and the money that he has. And so, you know, you need ca campaigns start with good candidates. And, and it's not no disrespect to the two that are to the two that are running. But um, you know, you needed to have uh, a front bencher, um, you know, and you didn't get the front bencher because of the money, because of the name, because of the organizational strength. And so it, it sort of feeds itself. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about Tom Kane. And of course, Tom Kane's father also um, was um, a famous New Jersey politician. There are two ways to, to try and transfer um, to your son, uh, electoral support. And, um, you know, in one case, you have a guy who has been running in Hudson County for 48 years. He's been, he's been on the ballot for the last 48 years. And then you have, you know, a guy who, and of course this is not Tom Kane Jr.'s first election by any means, but you know, his dad last ran 35 years ago. So, you know, there's a way to do this and there's a way not to do this. And the shelf life is short, right? You know, voter turnover happens fast. And, um, you know, 
Menendez, they have picked their time, they have picked their spot. If there's ever going to be a way that you're going to transfer that um, support, this is going to be it. This is it. Also, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I'll, I'll just add that because I've definitely seen some people talking about how you know, when when the elder Menendez, when Senator Menendez ran for re-election in 2018, he had a kind of lackluster primary showing where he only got 62% of the vote. Um, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a surprise that that he did that poorly against a pretty unknown candidate, Lisa McCormick, who's who's kind of a gadfly. But if you look at specifically in the kind, by the way, Joey, it, kind of yeah. is the yeah. is the understatement <laughs> of the year. I mean, she is the poster okay, she's, child she's, for she's, gadfly. So, uh, but he had also just beaten federal charges. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Didn't want to make this a uh, this a Lisa McCormick uh, <laughs> yeah. as Zoom, so I figured I would leave it at that. But you know, yeah, sure, yeah, was incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you look specifically at the counties in District 8, you know, Menendez got 78% of the vote in Hudson County. So even with the, the Senator Menendez's brand, you know, maybe a little less strong than it once was in the state, it, like because of, because of the trial that happened in, mm -hmm. in, around that time, it's, it's still really strong. It doesn't matter. They, they love the Menendez's in Hudson yeah, County. Exactly. And there's, and there's, there's no doubt about that. And I was, you know, I, I saw a photo online a couple hours ago of Brian Stack in Union City. He he must have had four hundred people for a meeting for to to go over how they're doing tomorrow in in one town. So, I mean, for with, the with, primary, for an you know, for yeah, that's it's, that's it's unbelievable. Just, it's incredible. But as long as we're talking about names, you know, the 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 uh, we. I mean, this is this is a state where you have. Uh, uh, old families running for office. Menendez uh, has been in politics since the 80s. Uh, the Keynes, who have been in politics uh, for a very, very long time, going back to uh, uh, the Continental Congress. And you have Donald Payne. And Donald Payne has two primary opponents uh, in the 10th district. Uh, uh, that's it's a big block of Essex County, a little bit of uh, a little bit of, of Union, uh, a little bit of Hudson in, in Jersey City. Uh, Payne, I think, has run maybe one of the best campaigns of this cycle. Uh, he recognized that he hadn't had to run strong races over the last few years. This is a safe Democratic district, one of the safest in the country. Uh, but he took this race seriously. Uh, he's raised a lot of money for a guy who didn't seem to like to raise money. Uh, he's gone out. He's gotten a lot of endorsements. He's gotten uh, progressive uh, groups and and progressive leaning labor unions. Uh, you know, he 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 took this, I think, as seriously as as he could. Is Mike? Is there? I mean, is, I, I, are there I any chance for any, he's running against Amani Oakley and Akil Kalfani? And Oakley, Oakley with a lot of bluster, but you know, I think it's telling, by the way, that that the three people she's worked for, uh, all very briefly, all very short term, uh, almost temp like gigs in the way that she uh, she goes mm -hmm. through jobs. Uh, but she she uh, she worked for Cory Booker. Cory Booker's for Donald Payne. She worked for Brittany Timberlake. Brittany Timberlake's for Donald Payne. She worked for. For New Jersey working families, uh, is their organizing director? They've endorsed Donald Payne. They did it unanimously. Is there is there anything going on here for an upset? Not that I can see. You know, one of the one of the things um, that I track here with the with the voting by mail. Essex hates voting by mail. By the way, they just hate it. And he has you know lit the fire. And um, it's not that the numbers are great but they're stronger than they would be if he didn't have a race on his hands. So for example, in this primary so far, there are, are 10,500 votes so cast so far. Now we were just talking about the low benchmark of the Republicans in District 5 with 4,200 votes. In District 10, which is, which is you know, a number where you would not normally expect to see much vote by mail activity at all, there are over 10,000 Democratic votes already banked. So in less, one of the renegades has 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 been at work and booked them. That's organizational strength, and you would assume that Payne is going to do well there. Joey, what do you think? You think he's? We looking at anything here? 
Yeah, I mean, I think from from the outside, this this kind of looks like it could have the making of some other upsets that have happened in recent years on, on both sides. Most famous, obviously, being Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in New York. You've got Lauren Boebert in Colorado on the Republican side. You know, you do have these cases where people come a little bit out of the blue and, and win nomination against a pretty entrenched incumbent, just sort of, and everyone's just sort of shocked by it. That there's not much chance for that here, um, mainly because A, as you've noted, Payne is very engaged. He is not sleeping on this. He, he is pushing pretty hard for this. And B, it's just Oakley had to, to outflank him from the left. That is basically what needed to happen. And the people who are endorsing pain are making that really hard to do. You've got, especially New Jersey Working Families Party. That's, you know, she's worked for it. That's an organization that really likes to create little fires in New Jersey democratic politics and, and force people to run hard. And they're backing the incumbent. They're, they're, they're backing the longtime incumbent. Um, so I just, there's not, she needed to have some kind of lane here that she has not found. So I don't see what the math would be that, that gets her over the, anywhere near the finish line. I think what's most interesting is to see, you know, Payne is going to clean up in Newark and, you know, the immediate, very heavily black areas around Newark, pretty much no matter what, that's almost a given. Um, what I think will be interesting is to see how some of the more outlying parts of the district, both the sort of liberal outlying parts like um, like Montclair, and then the more conservative out, uh, conservative outlying parts, like I forget if it's Caldwell or West Caldwell. I know we've had a lot of discussions about this, yeah. Dave, about which Caldwell ended up in the yeah. 10th versus the 11th district. It's it's Caldwell. They put the wrong Caldwell in the district. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, John Wallace, for being awake. So, so we'll see how those vote. I'm curious to see how those vote purely from an academic perspective of how how far does the pain name reach. But in terms of who's going to be in Congress come 2023, it's it's going to be pain. I don't I don't really see how it can be anything else. You know, we'll talk about this point again that Joey's talking about um, when we talk about Chris Smith. But um, one of the ingredients um, that you have to see, and the Globe has looked carefully at this, um, if you're ever going to knock off an incumbent member of Congress, one of the necessary ingredients, almost more than money, almost more than one, is catching the incumbent by surprise mm -hmm. is they have to be asleep at the wheel. And that doesn't seem to have happened this time for better or for worse. You know, that's one of the things that has to happen. And uh, pain is not sleeping at this point. No. And I, I mean, you know, I, I, I use this as an example. Uh, uh, I think a lot of credit, a lot of, I mean, a lot of credit goes to Donald Payne, but a lot of credit goes to Leroy Jones, the, the democratic state chairman, the Essex County democratic chairman, uh, a a longtime ally of the pains and 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 he, he kicked Donald Payne in the pants a little bit a year ago and said let's let's get moving and and this you know one of my takeaways of this campaign is is I, I was told Congressman Payne called Chairman Jones and said how many signatures do you think I need on the petitions I know I only I only need two hundred but how many should I get and. Leroy Jones said to him, and I don't know if he was serious or joking, but he said, go get 10,000. <laughs> and and Payne filed with 10,000. So he's showing, as a guy who's been in Congress a while, he's still willing to take direction. And I think that's important. And, and you know, one other point I want to make is, is I think there's I think there's two things that have gone wrong for Amani Oakley. And I, you know, I'll see if you agree with me or not. Uh, one is I don't get the impression she's got that likability that you need to have to to pull off an upset. Uh, you know, certainly an indication of that is that her the people she's worked for, the people who know her best, aren't for her. But the second, much more important, is is if you're going to the run to the left of somebody in a Democratic primary, uh, there's got to be a left to run to. And and I know for one of the stories I wrote about this race. Uh, I did a comparison of uh, uh, ProPublica has a great tool where you can compare different members of Congress. Uh, Donald Payne and AOC voted together 97% of the time. Yeah. So from a progressive angle in a Democratic primary, Micah, what's, what's really left there to run for? Well, there's not. And almost like if you can find <laughs> issues to run to the left, people, voters in this district aren't really interested in them. Um, you know, so, so um, there's not a lot of daylight. You really have to go out of your way to find it. And, um, and, and it's just not where 
these particular voters are, right? I mean, it's just not where this district is. It's not, we've talked about before that New Jersey is, is, is blue. New Jersey is, is, is Democrat. New Jersey is not necessarily hard, hard liberal. And we have that discussion all the time and whether or not, um, you know, Democrats tend to forget that sometimes. But, um, you know, I think that the progressives tend to really put a lot into that idea. Um, whether or not that's where the mainstream is, is a different story. And I think that that's a question that's being waged nationally. It's not just a question that's being waged here in New Jersey. But, you know, I think whether you go into downtown Newark or whether you go into um, some of the suburbs, people are only interested in going so far to the left or so far to the right. Mm -hmm. Mainstream is still very important to New Jerseyans and always will be important to New Jerseyans. I think you're right. I think you're right. And so, I mean, we don't have to talk about District 9. Uh, no op primaries in either Battle party. of the so, Bills. Yeah, Battle of the Bills. So we'll still, we'll still Bill Pascrell running, uh, I think it's a 13th term against Billy Prempa. That's, that, that is done. Uh, we go to the 11th where Mikey Sherrill is running for a, for a third term. Uh, four candidates running there. Uh, 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 one of them, one of them hasn't really done anything. Ruth McAndrew, I, I think it's safe to put her aside. And so what you have- There's, actually, there's five, sorry, just quickly. It's five. also Alex Holter, oh, who is in right. the same category right. as Ruth McAndrew. Both of them are, are gonna each get a few points, not gonna really shape the overall contours Nothing. of the race very much. Nothing. And by the way, that's a that's a, a takeaway in New Jersey and everywhere is if you're gonna run for Congress, you gotta run a campaign. You can't just you know, go down to the Secretary of State's office and file a petition and say, "Look at me, I'm in the race." And and what's the point? And yeah, yeah and, and and they're going to lose. But but this is a this is a strange primary. I think Typhoon Selen has an edge. He's a Morris County Commissioner because he's got the line in Morris and Essex. But Paul DeGroot has been holding his own in fundraising, and he's he's got uh, the line in Passaic County. Uh, and then you have a, a a new guy, Toby Anderson, uh, a an army veteran uh, uh, who who has been running hard, but you know, I think I think we all we all miss something sometimes, and that is people who who uh, uh, their campaign is in a bubble, and the three of us we're in this bubble, we're mm -hmm. watching it, but but I mean, Joey, you 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 you. You deserve to go first on this because you endured the Morris County Republican Convention, the uh, 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 the very very long evening. But outside outside the bubble, is this a race of whether the Morris and Essex lines hold for Typhoon Salon? I mean, I don't know if this is answering that question directly. This is a race that just has fallen off a lot of people's radars. Um, it's in a district that was held by Republicans only a few years ago but it voted for Joe Biden after redistricting a vote for Joe Biden by 17 points. That is a stretch, even in a really good Republican year. Democrats, I'm not sure if they flipped anything that red, even in 2018, they held a couple things that were that red, but I don't think they flipped anything that red. So, I mean, that is a, that is a stretch uh, right off the bat. And national Republicans are not super interested. None of these candidates have made it onto the, on the radar list. Um, when New Jersey Republicans are sending out their, their various emails against the Congress people that they want to defeat, Mikey Sherrill has been dropped from that list. You don't even see her name on it anymore. Right. So right off the bat, that's a that's kind of a the shadow looming over this race is Mikey Sherrill. She's a strong incumbent. Republicans are nervous about their or they're, they're not super confident about their ability to beat her, and that will always sort of cast a pall over whoever the victor of this race is. As for you know the people who one of these people is going to win the Republican primary, even if they even if they lose in the general election, I think that Selin has a pretty clear edge. He is running about even with DeGroote and fundraising, sort of, but DeGroote has done a lot more self-funding. He hasn't proven all that much grassroots strength. So that's one, one thing in Selen's favor. Another thing is, it, you know, it sounds good if you just say, well, Selen's gotten two lines, Morris and Essex, and, and DeGroote's gotten one line. Okay, but that one line in Passaic accounts for about 11% uh, of the district's Republican primary votes, mm -hmm. the other 90% come from, from the two counties that Selen has got the line in. And then I think the most telling thing is that in the last couple of days, both Paul DeGroot and Toby Anderson have gone after Selin for his Turkish roots. Um, Selin is an immigrant from Turkey who he was, I believe, the first Turkish-American mayor, at least yes. in New Jersey, maybe mm -hmm. in the country. 
um, before he became a county commissioner. You know, that is part of his life story. When I went to the convention, he, he brought that up and it was, you know, a popular story. Obviously, he ended up winning the convention. Um, that strikes me as the kind of attack that you only run when you know you're behind. So I think and none of them are spending the money to be able there, there, there's not that. enough yeah. money being spent out there for that attack to go out beyond the bubble. Oh, and that's also true, right? Like yeah. a lot of people are going to go to the polls, not really knowing what's going on in this race, because there hasn't been the kind of money or national attention focused on it. And they're going to see who's on the line. And then, I mean, that's just kind of how the line works in a lot of these races, right? That's why people on the line oftentimes win, especially in lower profile races, because people, even, even voters who vote in primaries who are already more informed than your average voter still don't necessarily, you know, know all that much about the candidates. Uh, and especially right. in a race like this, where the candidates themselves are, don't have super high profiles, don't have the money to get their message out. Micah, I was looking at, uh, at some numbers that were prepared by by Ryan Dubicki of the mm -hmm. Associated Press, mm -hmm. who for people out there that are watching this, if they don't know the name Ryan Dubicki, they 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 sure should because you should he follow is, him. Yeah, yeah, he is. Not only is he producing these numbers, David, yeah. but he's also told me today he's like following five other primaries for tomorrow, which is amazing. Yeah. He's yeah. just just really really good. Uh, one of the things he showed me was of the early votes cast. So that's. That's vote by mail returned and the early votes. The, mm -hmm. the what, what, what the Associated Press calls votes in advance. Seventy-two percent of the Republican votes are coming out of Morris County. Yeah, that's right. Almost nothing out of uh, yeah. Essex, eight hundred votes, and almost nothing out of Passaic, four hundred votes. And so, really, what that tells you again, I don't want to overemphasize the early vote in a Republican primary because mm -hmm. we know that Republicans don't love mm -hmm. to vote early. However, even by Republican performance, this is a laggard district. This is back in that um, District 5. It's, it's got 4,500 advanced votes so far, um, you know, where five was 4,200. And you've got some districts, the ones where there is some life being breathed in them, some campaigns being run in them, where you've got double that. You've got 9,500 votes or 9,000 votes. And so even by the smaller expectations that we have for Republicans, there are districts where there is just no activity and there are districts where there is some activity and this is not one of them. Okay. So let's go to, let's go to district seven. This is, uh, uh, this is where we'll lead off when we go through congressional races for the fall. This is the, uh, the most competitive race in the state. It's the one that got, uh, changed dramatically, uh, in redistricting, uh, you know, Tom Malinowski is running against Roger Bacon, who tried to run against uh, 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 Governor Murphy last year until, until Raj Parikh took him out in a in a in a uh, petition challenge. Uh, uh, but I mean, that's that's not going anywhere. Uh, uh, this is one of these primary challenges where where Malinowski is going to coast. But the general uh, there are there are seven Republicans running in the seventh. Uh, Tom Kane Jr., who came within one percentage point of beating Malinowski uh, two years ago, former Senate Minority Leader, as Micah said earlier, the you know the son of a of perhaps the most the most popular governor in in, in New Jersey history, uh, uh, but but he's got he's got some some very loud opposition uh, okay. in this race, and you know Eric Peterson, sitting assemblyman. Uh, who who uh, represents parts of Hunterdon and Somerset and Warren County. He's, he's got part of his legislative district where he's won is in this district. You've got you got Phil Rizzo, uh, who ran for governor last year, uh, you know, not setting the world on fire in, in terms of fundraising, neither of them. Uh, you've got John Henry Eisman, who who came on very strong at the beginning uh, and and uh, ran ran better than expected in the Hunter and Morris conventions, but he too has not raised the money. He might be uh, a candidate for something in the future, but but I don't think it's happening this year. John Flora, Mayor of Frieden, and and you know two other guys you know that are that are going to be at the at the bottom. Uh, this is this is what Kane wanted, I think, which was not 
a two candidate race of Tom right. Kane against a a conservative Republican. Uh, Micah, is this is this going to be is this going to be one of these races where Kane with the organization lines and a huge financial advantage and and uh, endorsements from Kevin McCarthy and and Elise Stefanik and and uh, uh, you know really really every every establishment figure in that district uh uh is there do you see a problem with kane winning this nomination no i don't see a problem i think that number one he's got his act together and number two none of his opposition really has its act together and you've got a crowded field running against him and so i think when you add all those things together you don't really have anybody having much of a chance even if you had a rizzo that was um, you know, catching on, that would be something, but he would still have to share the field with all these other candidates. As it stands, he hasn't really caught on, he hasn't really captured anybody's imagination, and he's still got to share the field with all of these other candidates who for better or for worse, are the opposition to Kane. Kane is the guy to beat in the race. And so if you had this one-on-one, -on -one, you might have a chance, but you don't have a one-on-one. -on -one. And so that makes it even less of a chance that you can catch him. You know, I mean, look, house races are tough because the window is so short every two years, right? And so the fact that Tom Kane has been running now for four years gives him an extraordinary head start. If you have to announce and start raising money and try to stay even with the guy, or the incumbent, it's very, very hard to do. The window is just prohibitive. It makes it very, very, this is why incumbents generally win house races. And you know, Tom Kane Jr., it seems to me, is, is more conservative than his father was. Uh, more conservative in the legislature, more conservative as a candidate for a higher office. I, I think that might be, uh, that might be, part of Tom Malinowski's general election strategy is to go to uh, to independents, to to moderate Republicans and and say, you know, this isn't his father, Tom Kane Jr. You know, put out a piece of mail where he said he is uh, uh, he said he, he that Donald Trump's policies were very good for for the country. Uh, I think I think Kane is making himself look more conservative because he is. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, that Malinowski is taking notes on that. Does Joey, does that, I mean, what do you, what do you see in this primary overall? Do you think, I'll ask you the same question I asked Mike is, can Tom Kane lose this? No, it's no. just, it doesn't really, it doesn't add up. Um, you know, the kind of ideological divide that you might end up seeing him lose. I'm not sure if a huge portion of Republican primary voters really don't trust him to the extent that Eric Peterson and Phil Rizzo think that they don't trust him. And what's more, even if a huge percentage didn't trust him, he can still easily win this primary with 40% of the vote. Um, that's not going to look great for him. Uh, and that means that 60% of Republican voters are, are skeptical of him, but still a victory. Um, and also, I think that you could have seen a geographic divide here where, you know, Peterson came pretty close to winning the convention in his home county of Hunterdon. But he didn't. Um, and I'm not really sure if any candidate other than Kane has the resources or the local name recognition to really create a regional contest of like Union County versus versus the outlying counties like Hunterd and, and, and Warren and Sussex to make this into anything. So I think all the factors that you might see, um, it, it, all the factors that you would see if this could this could produce an upset, you don't really see here. Mm -hmm. And it's he's taking it seriously, and I and I think that's I think that's a big part of it. I you know you you know the the value I place on the history, and I I think back of of to Tom Kane Senior's uh, primary for governor in 1981. He he won a statewide primary with 31 percent of the vote, and then was elected governor with 40 uh, 49 percent of the vote, in, in a very close race. So so you don't have to win these primaries by by huge margins in order to in order to take them. I mean, Tom Malinowski, it wasn't a primary, but in the convention season, basically got the Democratic nomination for the seventh district in, in 2018 by one vote. Mm -hmm. um, and then last year he won re-election by one point. And you know, he's just as much of a congressperson right now, anyways, as anyone else in Congress. So he yeah. is living evidence that whatever your victory margin, it's a victory. I yeah. want to just I, I, go ahead, Mike. While you're talking, I'm gonna 
I'm going to put one of the primary ballots up because I just want, you know, I want to show no, you how. Go you go ahead. No, I mean, I just want to show how how crowded this is. This is Hunterdon. And and uh, this is what a line looks like, which is uh, which is which is Tom Kane and uh, uh, and six others. And this is this is the flip of of what we talked about is lacking in Bergen. Look at I mean look at you know so so Tom Kane has the poll position both by column and by row. So it's you yeah. know, he's Pilata is in that same spot you know on the top left. Um, and yeah, what's more, I mean, at least in this particular county, I, I know this is only only Hunterdon, right? Um, but you've got the three sort of also rands in positions two, three, and four, which yeah. is a bit unfortunate for the people who are running serious right. campaigns, right? It's you know, it, you know, something Joey said. You know, it, it, here's the thing: it's almost the flip of Donald Payne's challenge that he's getting, um, where the question is, how much to the left do you want somebody to be? If you want somebody to be to the left of AOC. You got to remember when it comes to these Republican voters in the seventh district, they may not be, um, you know, movement conservatives. They're more traditional, you know, Republicans, right? I, and so, so the question is, how far right do you want them to be? The Cain family has always been plenty right enough for them, and so, um, you know, for Rizzo to be coming in and saying it's not right enough, I don't know if that's enough, especially that's in a competitive safe. district. Right. Especially in a district that they're not just like, oh, yeah, this is going to be our next Congress person. When when Tom Kane gets to say, I am the only one who can beat Tom Malinowski, and he can say that semi-convincingly. Who knows if Phil yeah. Rizzo could beat Tom Malinowski? That would be a weird race. That that definitely boosts him as well. Voters are strategic in ways that maybe we don't always expect. So somebody said to me today that we'll know how this primary goes when we see Warren County numbers, That that if there's any place in this district that is noticeably more conservative in terms of a Republican primary electorate. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's the county that elects Michael Darty to the state Senate. It's, it's where Doug Steinhardt is the county chairman. If Warren County are, are conservative, they've always been more conservative than yeah. other Republican mm -hmm. counties in the state. Uh, I, you know, we'll we'll see. Of course, Warren also comes in a little bit later than than others. Uh, it's a uh, Joey and I use this term. It's a it's a PDF county. So we have to wait till late at night when the numbers are all sort of final and and a PDF is put up in these results. But but the campaigns will know. And if Warren County is is going for Kane, I don't I don't see anybody else not doing it. So. And and the Republicans in the in the local elected Republicans anyway, which is not certainly not everybody, but but they're, they're all lined up um, for for Kane and and moving their voters out for Kane. And so I just don't see where there's a lot of daylight there for for the for the opponent. Yeah. All right. So let's go to I mean, District 12. Again, it's you know, it's one of the districts that's that's easy because both candidates are are unopposed. Uh, uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman. This is this is a Democratic district. It's it's going to be it's going to be fun to watch Darius Mayfield in the general. He's running a a different kind of campaign than Republicans have, uh, and that's probably a district that needs a different kind of race. Uh, district six, Frank Pallone, and and you know for for old guys like Mike and I who've been watching Pallone's, you know since the early eighties, uh, you know they always think they can beat him, uh, and. He's had some closer races than than he would like, but but uh, he's never lost an election for state senator for Congress in in this district. Uh, Republican primary going on uh, between Sue Kiley, a Monmouth County commissioner, and Rick Maida, who was the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate against Cory Booker. He uh, he's from Morris County. Started out running in the seventh. Uh, moved down to the six to run, but the lines went to Kylie. Joey, is this, you know, tell me, I mean, this, this is not a, a, this is not a high spending race, uh, uh, but Kylie between the lines and, and maybe the built-in advantage that Art Gallagher gives her because he, he knows how to stretch a, a, a dollar, uh, almost, almost as good as anybody in the state besides Steve Cush. Uh, Joey, is there a, is there a path to Rick Maida winning an upset here? I mean, this district really has echoes of the 11th district. I feel like the, the, the two mm -hmm. districts are very much peas in a pod with both of them having 
you know, modestly popular and also decently, like, like not super high profile, but fairly popular county commissioners who are, who have the lines and who are running against other candidates who are certainly not gadflies. You know, they're running serious campaigns, um, but they haven't necessarily found a convincing niche. Uh, Rick Maida is running sort of as a, a hard right sort of MAGA styled Republican. Um, not really clear if Republican voters, given that he hasn't had the resources or any kind of endorsements to really push that all that far, it's not really clear if voters are gonna are gonna jump for that when they've got you know just sort of a a local person in, in Sue Kylie right there. The, I I would think though maybe the one threat for for Kylie is that she is a Monmouth politician and this district, even though Pallone is also a Monmouth politician, the district is actually pretty heavily Middlesex. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have the time to, to calculate Republican primary um, uh, differences and this just, and the Monmouth County yeah. portion is more Republican. So this is slightly off, but in terms of overall right. population, it's like one third, two thirds Monmouth Middlesex. Do you have- well, that's, that's pretty good back of the envelope, Joey, because yeah. at least on performance so far, which is dangerous, but um, if you look at the total advance vote so far, first of all, this district is, is down near the bottom of the state. 3,600 votes, which is really subpar performance, but 2,100 advanced votes in Middlesex, 1,500 in Monmouth. And that's with all of the structural advantages that you mentioned, her organizational support, her being an elected official, you know, only, and, and Monmouth likes to vote by in-person early votes. Monmouth Republicans like to vote. There are less than 500 in-person early votes for her so far in this district. And so it's really not, a blip on the screen yet. Um, whether it will be tomorrow is a different story. But um, and Mike, I just I don't want everybody to start yeah. going going crazy on Twitter. When you say five hundred votes for her, you mean five hundred votes I'm cast sorry, in, in Mammoth? Thank we, you. We, yes. we, we, oh, we, do do how, we 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 don't know how we do not know how thank anybody you. voted thank under you. any circumstances. No, 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 no. I was yeah. <laughs> I'm not sorry to the count so. to Joey talking yeah. about how much of the district she represents. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yes, Mammoth, you're right. Thank I mean, you. So. So, like, technically, I see a path forward for Mehta here, where he cobbles together a coalition of very conservative voters who are looking for, you know, the most Trump-aligned candidate they can find, even if Trump himself hasn't endorsed in the race or done anything. Like, you know, he's running on the ballot as America First Republican or something like that. So he signaled like that. So you got that part of the coalition. If you keep Kylie's margin down in Middlesex, where she's not mm -hmm. from, and you, um, there aren't a ton of Asian American Republicans, but there are a fair number. And Maida would be the first South Asian member of Congress mm -hmm. from New Jersey. That would be a, a genuine you know, claim to fame. Um, so if he can somehow get those three groups to all harmonize, that could be a winning coalition. I'm not gonna count it out. There That's hasn't been, point. he doesn't have the money really to push for that all that hard. So it would have to be a pretty great stroke of luck for that all to come together because he's yeah. not necessarily able to do it yeah. by himself. And you'd have to imagine Monmouth Republicans are going to get out what they can tomorrow. So, yeah, that'll be countervailing that. And Sean Golden running for, he's the county chairman, running for re-election as sheriff. Uh, he's got a primary opponent, a guy, Gary Rich, who used to be a county commissioner until yeah. he fell out of favor with Golden. So so uh, that, that will help move Monmouth votes everywhere. So let's talk about District 4. Uh, this has been an interesting race. This is uh, Chris Smith has been uh, uh, the congressman since since he he was he was elected at age 27 in 1980. Uh, I remember when he was elected against one of the the against Frank Thompson, an abscam uh, congressman. Nobody saw that coming. That was just a, a huge upset. Smith had been, you know, uh, in 78, beaten badly by uh by by Thompson and then all of a sudden between Ronald Reagan and a scandal and he wins and I remember everybody said one term that's it he's a goner you know you 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 look at you look at the almanac of American politics from 1982 and it it said that Chris Smith is a is a, is a goner uh and he is now the longest serving congressman in the history of the state and not a goner he's a lifer He's a lot, and he, but and, and by the way, longest serving congressman, and and still younger than that. I think five or six other members of the delegation. Yeah, he can go on uh, as long as he wants. Yeah. So 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 he can, but he's got a, and this this is why I think the race is interesting. 
is is Donald Trump put a target on Christmas back and said, this is one of the Republicans that needs a primary opponent. And Mike Crispy, who had lived in Morris County, had run for freeholder there five years ago, he he answered that call uh, 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 with Roger Stone as his uh, top advisor. And he went to the fourth district and he's been he's been running a, a, a campaign there. Uh, not Smith again, you know, and there's there's I, I, I can't help but think of the, the pain comparison uh, uh, yeah. in the sense that Smith has taken this seriously. But what may put Smith into a different category is is here's a guy over the last 42 years, he's been written off time and time again. He was going to lose to Merlino and to Laurenti and Hedden. And, you know, and you skip through Brian Hughes and Reed Gushora and, and, and Kevin Muir, and he's run, I mean, you know, he's gone through, through all of these opponents. And, and I mean, even four years ago in the democratic wave, uh, Josh Welly, whose, whose name is, is becoming increasingly, less remembered in New Jersey politics, but he raised over a million dollars. So Smith, Smith seems to be, you know, he, I don't want to say seems to, he's taking this seriously. Guys raise more money than he's ever run before. And, and it's a new district. The district is even safer for him in a general. So, so this is the campaign he's got to win. Um, Mike, is there, I mean, is, is there any chance that the, uh, that the longest serving congressman in New Jersey history loses this primer? There is a chance. I, 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 I don't think it's a great one from what we're seeing so far, but there is a chance. And that is because if Republicans, renegade Republicans, uh, have taken hold anywhere, it's here. Crispy does seem to have the ability to mobilize some disaffected Republicans, the outside, the anti-establishment Republicans. He's gotten you know rallies together. He has the podcast slash talk show residual value, right? He's able to pull people, some people together. Look, it's not a, we, we've talked about a number of ingredients that incumbency, they need to not be caught by surprise. You, you haven't caught Chris Smith by surprise. That's probably when you, you look at it on paper, that's probably the biggest difficulty that I think Crispy has is that you would need to have caught Chris Smith asleep at the wheel, not fighting for himself, he was never going to do that because it's a new district. So he was never going to take that for granted. Now you add on top of that, the fact that he's got some opposition that he wasn't going to take for granted. So if Crispy ever had a shot at catching Chris Smith by surprise, this is not it. Um, he also, we talked about uh, Sheriff Golden getting out in Monmouth County and bringing votes over to Sue Kiley. Because Crispy has put together a line with county commissioner candidates in Ocean County, Ocean County Republicans have to get out if they want their commissioner candidates to win. They have to get out the organization support for, um, um, you know, for Chris Smith, and that's going to transfer to him. So I just I, I don't see a great shot. I don't see that there's been a lot of life so far breathed into the early voting. I think that there maybe is more renegade activity going on on the early vote side. But how that translates, I don't know. Maybe they've got as much as a thousand vote edge on the early vote, but Chris Smith could easily make up that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Joey, what do you 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 see a you see an upset in the making? Yeah, I don't have a ton a ton to add here. I mean, it's I don't know. You you, you could have seen this race take off if a number of a, a number of things had happened. If Crispy had turned out to be a gangbusters fundraiser, which definitely could have happened. You know, that was never that that was in the cards. He has. Trump world people like Roger Stone, Rudy Giuliani, Michael Flynn in his corner. He like that could have been leveraged into the, a great fundraising success. It wasn't. Um, you could have had the classic Trump complete and total endorsement coming along. It didn't. It's harder to articulate fire this congressman because Trump doesn't like him if you can't also say and Trump supports me. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. This is a this is a race that at several points along the way, especially you know when Trump sent off that message, and then a month later when this district was majorly re redrawn, Chris Smith's hometown was drawn out, got a bunch of new very conservative territory in, in Ocean County. You know there are lots of inflection points where this really could have turned a corner. It didn't necessarily. And a, and another factor that is hurting Crispy to some extent is that there are going to be two other um, non-Smith candidates on the ballot 
Uh, one is Steve Gray, who's also running a sort of Chris Smith is a conservative type camp, conservative enough type yeah. campaign. Has it look? It looks, by the way, that Steve Gray has. You know, this is this is this is what we talk about with people that maybe shouldn't have been in the first place. Uh, he ra- he he put some of his own money in the race, and then uh, a few weeks back took it took it back. He paid back his loan. He there there's there's no sign of any life of this guy. But if he gets 5% and then you've got another guy, Mike Blasey, who was running right. a relatively active campaign, not a lot of money, but you know, he was, he was campaigning, he was sending out press releases, et cetera, who dropped out, but will remain on the ballot. If each of those guys takes 5% of the vote, super reasonable to expect that that's 10% less of the vote that Crispy could theoretically uh-huh. win over. Yeah. And that makes it that much easier for Smith to, to win, even if it's a close race. Joe, is it too late for Donald Trump? I mean, here we it are. It is not. So I actually cut this line from a story recently. In 2018, um, Donald Trump endorsed Katie Arrington over Mark Sanford. And Mark Sanford was an incumbent congressman in South Carolina. Katie Arrington Mm -hmm. was a right-wing primary challenger who is a a state representative in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Trump endorsed her three hours before the polls closed. (laughs) Not open, closed. It was 4 p.m. on election day. So... Anything could happen. I was reading the press coverage from that time. All those poor journalists were frantically like, what the hell does this mean? I'm writing this at 420 on election day. What are we doing here? <laughs> that could happen. Yeah. Uh, who knows if that would even reach enough voters to be meaningful. If well, it remember, happened at this point, we're, we're less than 24 hours until polls close in New Jersey. So There's one very big difference. Donald Trump doesn't have Twitter now. That is a really <laughs> important difference. Right. Too. Although there are plenty of journalists who basically act like Donald Trump's Twitter. They're like, oh, well, yeah. he just said this. Yeah. And I think- Which, which does nothing stops anybody from saying that anyway. Yeah. Right. You know, and, I, and I, my guess is Roger Stone will continue to push for that endorsement right up, right up into the end. But, but the fact that Trump hasn't endorsed at all uh, changed this race. If Donald Trump had been for- uh, for Mike Crispy, if he had put out that endorsement a few weeks ago, uh, not only would have meant you know votes, but it would have meant money. It would have opened up a lot of money to come into the Crispy campaign that he that he hasn't had. So so here you have it, and I can't believe I'm I'm actually saying this after after 44 years of watching Chris Smith, uh, but he he has a significant financial advantage going into election day, and and that. You know, you know that has not not always been his strength. And I'll I'll tell you one last thing before we go on to to, to the other districts, and that is, uh, Micah, you've 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 watched these races for a long time. Smith is old school when it comes to constituent service, and and over four decades, he's helped he's helped a lot of people. Uh, yeah. Can you can you easily undo that kind of goodwill? By by some some negative ads at the at the end. No, no, and 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 that the 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 new district line almost doesn't even matter from that from from that perspective because he has helped so many people over the years. Um, I mean, I can tell you stories from either my family or my hometown where people who you just don't think um, are going to be Christmas supporters say, "Yeah, he helped me years ago, and so I've got to help the guy." Um, and, and, and that is the case, I'm telling you, if not, it, it's, it's, it probably exceeds the, the thousands, we're probably in the tens of thousands. Um, and, and given that he has represented most of Monmouth and Ocean County at some point in time, and the districts of the lines have changed, but um, you know, these towns that are newly in his district, most of them have, he's represented over the years. And he's represented yeah. them strongly. And so um, this is old school. He tracks them. He follows them. They've expressed support. And so he knows how to go back to them and say, thank you. Now I need you to show up tomorrow and vote for me. Um, he is old school in that regard. And so um, um, I just, I, I, I don't see him being caught by surprise. Okay. And I, 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 I tend to agree. I tend to agree. So let's, let's move on to, to the other districts. Just, I want to end up in district three. So we'll go. We'll south and, and then sort of fish hook up. But District 2, Jeff Van Drew has two primary opponents who say he's he's not conservative enough. Uh, you know, this is this is uh, after he won 80 percent two years ago with uh, President Trump coming to Wildwood and 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 pushing other Republicans out of that race. Uh, I think 
I think Jeff Van Drew is is as safe as any incumbent with a primary challenge tomorrow. Which is unbelievable when you think about what well, a two year old Republican, right? You know, yeah. but but he will never he will never have to prove his bona fides, right? Because because the story is so well known. Um, the story is known by everyone, um, is appreciated by everyone. Look. If you want to talk about the, the movement toward Republicans in South Jersey, there's a lot of claim that Jeff Van Drew can, can, can get and credit that he can get for being the start of that, for being the impetus of yeah. that. And, um, and, and you know, this was always such a natural fit for him um, to flip because his county, his home, is so Republican to begin with. So they were always going to embrace that. They were always going to be... You know, you could flip the switch at any given time and, and they were going to, you know, I mean, Democrats feel incredibly betrayed, but Republicans know that they do and they appreciate that. Yeah. So, so Joey, you've, you've covered a little bit of this primary uh, uh, between Tim Alexander and Carol and Rush. I mean, uh, Alexander has all the lines. He's got, you know, all the support. You know, we can, we can talk another time about whether this district's in play. I have... I have not heard any Democrats tell me that they think they're going to beat Van Drew in 2022. But but is 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 there anything going to be is there anything to pay attention to at all in the Democratic primary tomorrow? I mean, I think that Alexander is almost certainly going to win. He's got one opponent, Carolyn Rush, who isn't running a total nothing burger of a campaign. She's raised a bit of money. She has like a decent looking website, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But generally when there's a relatively low profile campaign, but one candidate has the monetary advantage and all the county lines, there's no reason to bet against that candidate. Um, especially in this kind of primary where both of them are ideologically in the same place. They just want to beat Jeff Van Drew. Um, so this primary is not, not the most interesting affair, similar to the Republican primary. You know, you're, you, you can really predict the winners in advance in this one. I think if Tim Alexander has a really weak showing, mm -hmm. then that might be a little bit of a warning sign, not just for November, where he's probably going to lose anyways, but for his future political career, even beyond that. Um, you know, the, the second legislative district, uh, Republicans just flipped or held all three of its seats last year. Democrats are really going to take it back, including with um, at least one candidate of color. They promised that. Tim Alexander fits that bill pretty well. He could have a strong political future, depending on how he does. So for me, what I'm going to be most looking for in this primary is he is a guy who is relatively unknown before this cycle, but Democrats have propped him up a fair bit. You know, he's got all the lines. Can he, does he have a convincing showing? Um, no. And that's not just for November, but but for any future career, that political career that he might want to have. And by the way, I mean, it's a good resume for 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 Tim Alexander. He's, he, he was he was in law enforcement. He was uh, uh, worked in the prosecutor's office while as an investigator, put himself through law school. Uh, became a di an assistant district attorney in Philadelphia, civil rights lawyer. He's he's a good candidate. Uh, bad district, just, wrong year though. Yeah, it's just kind of what it just is. A, just a bad year. And and District One, Donald Norcross is running against uh, Mario DeSantis. Uh, uh, I guess you know DeSantis's claim to fame is that last year when he ran against Steve Sweeney in the primary, he lasted one day. This time he's he's making it to uh, to the primary, but. But you know, Micah, you 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 follow you follow South Jersey pretty closely. This is, I mean, the the poster child for who the progressives dislike the most in the South yeah, is, yeah. is is George Norcross. Right. Uh, but they don't seem to hold that against his brother Donald. Isn't that amazing? And mm -hmm. I will also say that um, one thing that the progressives give grudging respect um, for, and actually, I shouldn't, I, I don't want to put it pejoratively. Um, Sue Altman has has said. She really does give hats off to the Camden Democrats for their early vote, and I don't want to single her out, but you know, I mean, she 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 readily admit they do a good job of their early vote. So in District One, just to give you some idea, we've talked about anemic statewide numbers. We've talked about you know, looking pretty good, but forty thousand early votes in District mm -hmm. One for the Democrats. Um, it is double the next county's performance, um, the next district's performance, I should say. Uh, district three has 20,000 Democratic votes. Um, it is just unbelievable. It's, um, it's more than you're gonna expect to see in some districts overall tomorrow. 
So it's just an incredible performance. They lock up those votes that they know that they've already got. You know, really, David, you and I talked about this, and maybe we won't get to talk about this tonight, but when you register to get a, a, a vote by mail ballot, when you ask for an, a vote by mail ballot every for every future election, that's like signing up for a ride to the polls every year mm -hmm. into the future, good point. right? It, th these yeah. are your high propensity voters. And so, you know, Camden just knows how to do this and do this well. And by the time you get to election day, it's almost all over because they've wrapped up so many votes. Yeah. And, and by the way, one observation, one, you know, big takeaway, uh, as you look at, at, at vote by mail and, uh, and, and where it is, I mean, this, this was ramped up in 2019. Uh, this is vote by mail in, in this current iteration, uh, you know, no longer absentee ballots. Uh, it's, it's really starting to take hold. And, and we should point out that one out of every six primary, really one out of six primary voters, uh, uh, I think, you know, add, add unaffiliated too, and you know, we'll, we'll see how many unaffiliated switch, switch to it. Unaffiliated, for those who don't know, will, uh, if they're automatic vote by mail voters, they will get a Democratic ballot and a Republican ballot. Uh, uh, if you were an unaffiliated voter and you're, you're watching this, first of all, God bless you, because I don't, I don't know that we really get many unaffiliated undecideds here, but, but it should be reminded that if you return both ballots, neither of them will count. Uh, and and you know you feel like you don't have to say that, but every every year for the last few years there've been people who have disenfranchised themselves because they thought they can vote in both primaries because they were sent ballots. It's one or the other, but one out of six. It it looks like vote by mail. You know maybe to maybe some people don't like it, but vote by mail is catching on, and it's a significant number of. New Jerseyans that that automatically get these ballots. So, I just yeah. think it's important to point that out. Eight eight hundred, almost nine hundred thousand people. Eight hundred and eighty three thousand people mm -hmm. have registered to get all few, uh, 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 vote by mail ballots in every future election. Just to give you an idea, twenty five hundred requested them for this election specifically. But you know, almost nine hundred thousand get them automatically for every mm -hmm. election at this point. So that's important. So let's let's go to District Three. Uh, which is an interesting primary. Uh, this is this is Andy Kim's district. Andy Kim's running for a third term. He he flipped the seat uh, by a narrow margin four years ago. Uh, he's got a primary opponent uh, uh, named Ruvin Hendler, uh, who who uh, uh, and, and I'm sure he's a nice guy. I don't want to disparage him or anything, but but. This is a live phantom candidate. This you you can see his picture. You know who he is. He talks, but but there's but he's really had two things that he's accomplished in this campaign. Uh, one is he 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 forced Jadis Miranov in Mercer County into court to to get a judge to validate the way they gave the line, and then and then he he debated Andy Kim uh, last week. The League of Women Voters held a debate. For the Democratic primary candidates, Andy Kim accepted that challenge. Here's a guy who I think, you know, could potentially, you know, an 80 percent, 90 percent of the vote. But he debated a guy who he didn't have to. I mean, Joey, why why would he do that? I mean, he's an earnest congressman who who takes his star pretty seriously and does what it, does what it requires. I, one thing that I'll say about both Kim and Malinowski is that they're sort of strange primary challengers. Kim's is from, from the left. Hendler is claiming that he's not progressive enough on, on some stuff. Uh, Bacon is obviously in, in the seventh district. Roger Bacon is challenging Malinowski from the right. He's just a pro-Trump guy. But both of them, if they come out of this winning these primaries by with 92% of the vote or something, you know, that's a statement. It's, it's not that important of a statement, but rather than just being uncontested, it's look, someone ran against me and I crushed them. You know, I took this race seriously and I won by a crap ton. And, you know, heading into what's likely to be a competitive mm -hmm. election cycle for both of them, that's not nothing. You know, that, that, that means a certain something. Um, so I think that to some extent, Bacon and, and Hendler have, have provided an interesting opportunity. Yeah. And Joey, I will say it just because I smiled. You, 
as your editor, you have my permission to do a headline. Kim wins by crap ton <laughs> if he if he wins by by those kinds of numbers. But the race to watch here is, is the Republican primary. And, and Michael, when I asked you about it, I'm, I'm just going to I want to I want to share that. Uh, I want to share that screen with you. Also, okay. the, just the, the Burlington portion of the ballot, because it's uh, uh, this is this is another one where the organization line is not in column one. Uh, you know, Michael, why don't, you know, I've done most, set up this race. What are we, you know, this is, uh, this is a fierce primary battle between two, two very different candidates who are very different than Andy Kim and two who, who may have at one time in their life been more similar to each other than, than they are today. But, but tell me about this race. Yeah, I would feel a lot more comfortable um, um, not that we're making calls because we're not making calls, but if Bob Healy was running in Ocean County where he enjoyed significant strength and thought he was going to be running, but then the district lines got drawn and he got drawn out of his own district essentially. And so he's running actually outside of his district. Um, he is just as much of an outsider really in Burlington County as um, Ian Smith is. The question is who's got more of a profile? So Bob Healy's been able to spend some money, um, but Ian Smith has whatever residual value comes from the fight that he had with the governor over his gym and the notoriety that comes with that and the notoriety, the bad notoriety that comes with the DUI stuff. So it's, it's just uh, certainly um, this is one of those races where you're going to go in, average voter is going to go in and look at this ballot and not really know what to do if they know nothing about, else about this race. It's not as if either of them are household names. It's not as if either of them have superior poll position going into this. Um, it's a, a toss up for lack of a better, you know, for lack of a better term, because um, nobody's been able to generate the advantage or the enthusiasm that you would want to see, that you'd be able to say somebody has the edge. I don't think either one's really done that at this point. And, you know, you'd say toss up, you know, it could be close. It could be a blowout. Uh, you know, none of us have seen poll numbers. Uh, you know, both, both campaigns are, are confident. They're always confident, but these two mm -hmm. are especially confident. Uh, Healy, you know, Healy's an, an interesting candidate. I mean, they're, they're both young. They're both in their 30s. Uh, Healy started out as a as a punk rocker when he was a kid. Uh, he now runs uh, his family business, Viking Yacht Company. So he he manufactures yachts, and and I can I can hear hear how how that is described. I heard it described in the debate. But the bottom line is, Viking Yacht Company employs about about 1600 people in South Jersey. So people it's, who call it, people who think that they're invoking a bad word with yacht don't really understand Southern Ocean County. Um, this is as blue collar an outfit as you, they may not be building boats for blue collar people, but they're certainly they're employing blue, blue collar people. And it is the lifeblood of Southern Ocean County. You literally can't go down the parkway um, through Southern Ocean County and miss the Viking boat yard. And uh, it is a, big deal. We often say this about these kinds of races for Congress, but you want to see somebody get in at a different level. Bob Healy could very well have a future in Republican politics in Ocean County and do very, very well. It just may or may not be at this level. He may not beat Andy Kim this time. He may not win the primary this time. Maybe he will, but um, uh, certainly Ocean County would love to bring him back if, he, if he's unsuccessful. Yeah. And just, just quick correction. He's from Burlington. Uh, doesn't oh. mean doesn't mean you can't move. People move all the right. time. Uh, okay. Sometimes multiple times in the same year. But, Thank you. Uh, but but oh, you're right. You're right. He's from the neck. He's from that little neck of road. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah, yeah he's yep. he's you're from right. Burlington. So you're right. So he's got the line in in Ocean. He's got he's got the line in Burlington. He's got the line in Monmouth, and he has the line in in Mercer. Uh, but he, but Smith. I mean, Smith got into this race with with huge expectations. Uh, uh, he he really did have a name among among activists who were most opposed to Governor Murphy's uh, policies during during COVID, uh, and 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 he was on national television, which which none of the other challengers in the ra this race have have gotten to. You know, uh, Steve Cush told me last week that 
that you know they're they're out there and they're knocking on doors and saying Ian Smith, the gym guy, and people are going, oh yeah, the gym guy, we we like him. Uh, you know, this is this is a race. You know, first of all, we'll talk about the line in Burlington. Uh, you know, I I look at it and I see, you know, it's 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 not like Ditzel and Fortune bring Bob Healy, uh, you know, coattails. Uh, it's not like those names are well known, uh, uh, and he is in a better ballot position. I think that helps. You know, as as you look at the ballot, you sort of wonder why they didn't get a sheriff candidate, because it does have that gaping hole there, a little bit of white space, and you, you just don't want to see white space on the ballot. Uh, Valerie Gallagher, and I'm not here to talk to her, you know, about her a lot, but she was she was arrested for for drunk driving. Uh, uh, at the end of April and, and didn't tell anybody, didn't tell her, her campaign manager, didn't tell her running mate and Smith from, from what I understand. Uh, and now, now that's out that, 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 by the way, to me is, is also a commentary on, on what you're dealing with, with campaigns now, uh, a year or two ago, or no more than two years ago, uh, these stories, drunk driving arrests with Ian Smith, with, with uh, Val Gallagher, uh, uh, stories about you know Healy, photos of him when he was a kid, uh, is a punk rocker. These have been front page on the Burlington County Times, and now the Burlington County Times, you know, thank thanks to thanks to to Gannett coming in and taking a nice you know newspaper that really was very good at local news and totally ruining it. Uh, I don't think people know about the race. I don't know that they know it's election day in Burlington County. I don't know that they know about the negatives, what Smith's saying about Healy and what Healy's saying about Smith. And, and, and we should let Joey jump in, but this is very, very recent. Kate Gibbs had some trouble two years ago in her race, and the, 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 the local media covered that story very, very thoroughly. And just two years later, it's night and day difference. Yeah. Joey, you have a... You have a prediction in this race? I mean, I think the most likely outcome is that Healy wins. Um, I, I, I feel like I've, I've said this in a lot of different ways tonight, and I'm going to say it in, in one more way here, that when a candidate has the line and a monetary advantage, it's difficult to overcome because um, that means that the organizations are, are in their corner and their opponents don't necessarily have the resources to sort of upend that. If any candidate can do it by sheer force of will, it's probably Ian Smith because he has that previously built in advantage. You know, you were saying people go door knocking. Oh, the gym guy. You know, that's that's hard to replicate. Uh, and I think it'll depend on, you know, how how bombastic some Republicans want to be. Once again, this is this is a district that voted for Joe Biden by 14 points. Um, voters in competitive districts tend to be kind of strategic with their voting. Uh, there's also a, it, there's a decent chance that there are going to be some voters who are who are more clued in who might think, you know, my top priority is beating Andy Kim. I don't know if Ian Smith can do that. That's definitely a real consideration that voters often have. Uh, so, this has been a word salad. I haven't come up with anything conclusive. Yeah. I think Healy's the favorite, but anything from like Healy winning by thirty points to Smith winning by five or ten, it wouldn't come as like a massive. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's going to be thirty, but but you know, I think. Uh, and, and this is this, by the way, and, and, and it's not at all how people vote, but but this is a face off between two pretty good Republican consultants. Chris Russell is working for Bob Healy and, and Steve Cush, who pulled off the the Ed Durr upset against Steve Sweeney in South Jersey last year is running this race. And he is, you know, he is as hands on as anybody I've ever seen. Yeah. And, and, and really something that's a little bit unusual for Republican consultants is they both know their area. Um, you know, Chris is, is in Ocean County. Um, you know, Steve is in what in Gloucester County. So they both yeah. really know what, what they're talking about here. They know their district. And uh, yeah. Chris ran John Runyon's campaign that beat John Adler. Then, then when Runyon, retired he he ran tom MacArthur's campaign uh tom MacArthur's three campaigns so uh chris has been involved in every congressional race uh in this district i i think at least 12 years maybe a little bit more uh and kush i mean kush beat steve sweeney on nothing and and healy's you know uh ian smith's got got a little bit 
you know, he's got, he certainly has more than nothing here. This is, uh, uh, this is base. And in a low turnout election, mm-hmm. like this is going to be, uh, I don't know what the model is going to be. I don't know what it is, but Mike and I want to ask Mike and Joey, bring, maybe the last question, you know, or among the last questions is which one of these does Andy Kim want? Oh, who does, who does Kim, does he want to run against Bob Healy or does he want to run against Ian Smith? I think I, my, my, I would, if it were me, I would want to run against um, Smith um, just because he's completely counterparty. Um, he's not going to have that inside support, that organizational support, you know, he'll, they'll line up behind him, but, but uh, he's going to be the outsider. I would want to run against the outsider. Joey, you're yeah, same. I mean, it just both because national Republicans are less likely to throw down money. Um, they're likely to turn their attention elsewhere. If, if Smith wins, not guaranteed, but I think that's a relatively likely conclusion. And I mean, Smith has a lot of liabilities that some of the things, I mean, the clear liability is the DUI arrest. That looks right. bad in any election. And then some things that are- and, and we're not, By the way, we're talking about DU, in fairness to, to this race, we're talking about a DUI arrest this year, and we're not talking about, about uh, uh, Ian Smith uh, sir, going to prison for- for a vehicular homicide conviction in in 2007, where he killed a 19 year old. I mean, uh, so yeah, so Andy Kim hire, spends a million dollars, hires a narrator to say Ian Smith killed a 19 year old while drunk driving like 15 years ago. Like yeah. this year, he proved he hasn't learned a thing. Easiest attack in the world. Yeah. And but then also some of the things that might be advantages in the Republican primary. You know, all of these very very anti Phil Murphy and anti COVID things not necessarily an asset in the general, even as Phil Murphy was doing pretty badly statewide, winning very narrowly, he still carried this district. This is not the kind of turf that is super amenable to this very bombastic Republican style. So if I'm Andy Kim, I mean, there are attack lines you could use against Bob Healy, but 100% I'd rather have Ian Smith. Now I'll tell you, I'm not, I'm not sure. And, and that doesn't make me right, but I'm not sure because, because Bob Healy, I mean, Andy, Andy Kim's never uh, run against uh, uh, somebody who's not a self-under. He beat Tom MacArthur. He, he beat David Richter. Uh, you know, I think he knows, I think he knows how to beat a candidate like Healy, uh, who may not rock the boat very much. Uh, I don't know what 2022 is going to look like. None of us do, you know, when we come to October and November. Uh, and it's important to say we don't know what it's going to look like in October. We used to say November, but people start voting uh, in September now. So this national environment is important. I don't know what Biden's going to look like in the third district. I don't know if there's going to be Phil Murphy fatigue in the third district come the fall. We don't know. You know, we don't know what's going to be happening in the world. We don't know what's going to be happening here. And and Smith has, I think, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not, I'm, I'm not pulling for one either way. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking an extra look at Smith and saying, okay, he's got, he's got some flaws, you know, which, which uh, are substantial. But, but we've seen flawed candidates, uh, hugely flawed candidates, win elections. Uh, uh, across the United States uh, over the last few years. Uh, people are much more forgiving than they ever have been. And Smith may activate a, a, a turnout of a non-traditional midterm election voter uh, that Healy might not be able to bring out. And, and Smith may say things that Healy might not say. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I, you know, I think Healy's got the advantage here, but, but, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where, uh, uh, I think Kim will just figure it out as he goes along. And I think that's, that's sort of what he's doing here. Unlike, unlike Josh Gottheimer, he's not trying to, uh, uh, put his thumb on the scale, uh, and, and help pick his candidate here. So, so I don't know. I don't know. I think, uh, I think we're probably looking at a, at a Kim, healing matchup but but after ed durr last year i i don't i don't know that i want to dismiss anybody well you'll know this time tomorrow night if um if smith is you know has any wildfire behind him or not right i mean mm-hmm. you'll know 
uh, pretty quickly whether or not uh, uh, Kim's got to prepare for that. Yeah. And, you know, as we're closing out, I, I, I see this name, Nicholas Ferrara, on the ballot. Uh, he's an attorney turned realtor in Hamilton Township. Uh, uh, no chance at all to win this, absolutely none. But it makes me think about some of these candidates on the ballot and, and which ones have have a future. You know, I, we, we think about Rush Holt running in the 96 primary and getting, you know, I think it was single digits. And, and, and I remember Andrew Zwicker ran for Congress against Bonnie Watson Coleman and, and Linda Greenstein and, and was way, way behind in fourth place. But, but sometimes running for office sets up your next run. Um, so, so just little things. I'm going to be watching Ferrara's numbers in Hamilton uh, to see if he's got anything going for him in his hometown. Uh, if he does, I, 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 I would think that Mercer County Republicans might look to him to run in the 14th district for the legislature next year. I, you know, I, I, I think John Henry Eisenman has a lot of talent. Uh, I don't think this is going to be his year, but, but I think he's got some talent, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure there will be, uh, some people encouraging him to, to make sure he's living in the 16th legislative district soon, uh, where they're looking for candidates. Uh, Tim Alexander lives in Galloway. Uh, Mike, I don't think anybody's talked more than you have about how Galloway is now in the legislative <laughs> district that it, that it ought to be in. And I think, right. you know, I think he's, he's a potential candidate. Joey, my dear, am I, am I missing anybody else on the ballot this year that I'm, I'm not taking seriously a congressional candidate, but, but could be the next Rush Holt or the next Andrew Zwicker? I mean, you're taking him seriously a congressional candidate. I think Nick DiGregorio has mm -hmm. two chances to lose in the next year, primary and general. And if he loses either, I think he could definitely be a strong legislative candidate going forward. Um, I honestly forget precisely what legislative district he's in because he, he, Bergen County he's got in, shuffled around. Yeah, he's in Fairlawn, so he's in Joe Lagana's district. And, okay, so yeah, and, that's a that's a potentially demo, competitive Democratic district uh -huh, that he could, he could upend. Yeah. As a matter of um, fact, if if Republicans have any hope and prayer yeah. to win the legislature, it they've, they've got to win places yeah. like fourteen and thirty eight. Yep. Yep. So yeah. so Di Gregorio could be you know you know I'm I'm sure if you ask him he will say no I want to be a congressman and that is. The right answer to give but but he is uh uh i agree with you there any any anybody else any other things that we should be watching tomorrow besides some of these local races and by the way I, you know I, I don't want to stay too long but but uh i would say that and we always do but <laughs> but i'll tell you one race that i'm watching very carefully and it's it's uh and i should say races and that's over 50 contested county committee seats in Tom's River on the Republican side, where George Gilmore is trying to take back the county chairmanship uh, against the sheriff, Mike Mastronardi. And, and that's going to generate some turnout uh, for, for both Smith and for mm -hmm. Crispy. Yes, it is. Uh, but but we'll, we'll know tomorrow how many, uh, if, if the magic of George Gilmore is, is in the past, despite his, you know, Five million dollars in in debt to government and loans, and and whether this is you know a guy who was arguably, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, one of the most powerful Republicans in the state. I mean, in the you know when I was doing the power list in 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 the you know from two thousand to two thousand ten, he was always way way high on the power list. We'll see if he if he regains his mojo, but he cannot win this county chairman's race if he can't win county committee seats in Tom's River. Uh, um, so here we are. This is, by the way, very Jersey, if this is where we end it, which is that we've <laughs> talked about races that could determine control of the United States House of Representatives for the next two years. And we're really ending it up on what matters in Jersey, which is 50 county committee seats in Tom's room. <laughs> so but it's the Ocean County Republican organization. So that's 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 all you have to that's say. That's it. Right? That's absolutely it. So. So we've we've doing this about an hour and a half. I don't know if there's anything more you want to add, but I'll add something really quickly, which yeah. is, you know, we we've talked about these primaries. What's one of the things that's interesting is that we've had 24 primaries, sort of, to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. 15 of them are contested, nine of them are uncontested, but we have candidates from both major parties in every district, even the ones where the various parties have no shot. And in fact, in some districts where the parties have no shot, 
they're running multiple candidates. There are two different Republicans running against Donald Payne, all to get 10% of the vote come November. There are two different Republicans running against Donald Norcross. Um, you know, you've got, especially on the Republican side, you've got this enthusiasm and that, that, you know, that shows up at many different parts of the process that shows up in how many primary votes are going to eventually come out that shows up in what seats are going to flip come November. But one of the first things that shows up in is who files. And there were a lot of people that filed. This was, and um, Republicans are really eager to flip these democratic seats, even ones like the sixth district that they, that's going to be a really heavy lift. They're eager to run even in, in uncompetitive districts. Democrats are, are willing to run even in uncompetitive districts like Matt Jenkins, who's the democratic nominee uncontested in the fourth district. It's, it's good to see. It's good that we can talk about 24 races that all exist. It's good that every single voter in the state, not necessarily in tomorrow's election, you know, Phil Murphy is going to be voting tomorrow. He's not going to have a single contested primary to vote for. Um, but come November, every single voter is going to get a genuine choice between candidates from, from the two major parties. Yeah, and, and that is good in the face of fewer candidates. The trend overall has been fewer candidates running. So clearly this time... This is another manifestation of the fact that Republicans seem to have enthusiasm on their side, right? They're, they're charged up and they're ready for what they perceive to be a good Republican year. And, um, and so that's why they all ran. In some cases, they should have figured out between them how to clear the field for one of their challenges because they would have had a better shot if they had but their enthusiasm can get the better of them. But it is, it is generally a good thing that they have this enthusiasm behind them. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. I, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the line, right? And we've talked about, you know, certainly not just tonight, and we don't want to get into a whole discussion tonight about the line, but in every case, it's something about, you know, not just the line. We're going to figure out how much credit to give the line. We're going to give, have, figure out how much credit to give fundraising. We're going to, you know, superior fundraising. How much did they have single opponents that they were running against or multiple candidates in the field? How much were they better known, right? You know, so the ballot position is certainly important, but I think you've shown tonight, David, and putting those on the screen, it's not all important. There are some times where the, the person without the line actually has the better ballot position. Um, and so, um, you know, we'll see what happens, but, uh, you know, I think all that enthusiasm in some cases, it, you know, it failed to clear that field behind one candidate as you would like to see if it had happened, yeah. if, if they were going to have a cleaner shot. Well, I, I, as always, this is, this is lots of fun. And Micah Rasmussen of the Revit Institute of New Jersey politics at Ryder university, Joey Fox of, of New Jersey globe, this, you know, we'll know, uh, uh, 24 hours from now, we'll know some of these races, but not all of them. And uh, uh, we'll all just we'll keep our fingers crossed that we have uh, a, a smooth election day. Uh, the people who want to vote can vote. That uh, uh, that that uh, numbers are counted carefully. That the technology works uh, at polling places, and uh, uh, and that we're we're not waiting two weeks for a winner. So thank you both for joining us and, and thanks everybody for watching.